Ready? I'll call the regular meeting of the City Council uh, for June 9th, 2009 to order. Um, uh, can we have a closed session report? Or the roll call first, please. The record will reflect that all members of council are present. Okay, closed session report from the City Attorney. Yes, Mr. Mayor. The City Council met in closed session to discuss various items that are reflected on the open session agenda based upon the exceptions to the Brown Act open session requirements as reflected on the open session agenda. It took reportable action on a number of different matters and I will address those issues at this point. Uh, under conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation, initiation of litigation, the City Council approved the Office of the City Attorney filing an action against the County of Orange regarding their excess the allegations of excess charging of the city for property tax administration fees that passed seven to zero. With respect to potential initiation of litigation regarding the Dover PCH property involving Red Bluff LLC, the City Council authorized the Office of the City Attorney to file a civil enforcement action for the appointment of a receiver to address that property. Uh, in the Superior Court, that action passed seven to zero. Um, with respect to Uyghur Brothers versus City of Newport Beach, new litigation that we've been authorized to defend the matter and we've been given direction on how to proceed with respect to that matter and the council action was seven to zero. With respect to a conference with legal counsel and anticipated litigation or potential litigation, the city council has addressed the issues with respect to that matter and other matters in that context and reportable action in that context relates to the City Council's authorization of the City Manager to execute a mutual separation agreement with the Chief of Police uh, with respect to mutual separation. I'd just like to note that in the context of this, it's appropriate to have a, a closed session agenda item in this context <clears throat> due to the multiple circumstances involved. I would point out there's been no threatened litigation specifically at all related to the Chief and I don't want to give that impression. Uh, the City Council has accepted and, and authorize the mutual separation agreement with Chief Klein. And at this point, Mr. Mayor, I believe there's something you'd like to say. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. City Attorney. It's with deep regret that the City Council this evening reluctantly accepted the early retirement of Police Chief John Klein. When Chief Klein first disclosed to the City Manager and City Council that he was considering early retirement, the Council and City Manager encouraged him to continue in office and expressed their full support of him in the event he decided to remain. Chief Klein ultimately decided that it was in the best interest of the residents of Newport Beach in the police department that he retire and provide an unfettered opportunity for the city to resolve the department's recently publicized controversies. While we believe that the chief's retirement has come too soon, John's decision is a clear demonstration of his character and his loyalty to the citizens of Newport Beach in the department he so ably led. John has served the city of Newport Beach for nearly three decades with honor and integrity. He has provided leadership in a variety of capacities and has been a major contributor to a police force that keeps this city among the safest in the nation. From the day he started as chief to his last day of work, we have had and will continue to have the utmost confidence in John's abilities and leadership in his ongoing contributions as leader of the department he will be sorely missed. John. Please accept our profound wishes to you and your family for a long and happy retirement. Um, I'd just like to say a few words personally. Um, John, in the last few years, I've got to know you quite well. Um, you're probably one of the most decent and honorable men I've ever worked with. Um, you've been a, I believe, an inspirational leader in the, in the police department. Um, you've shown great uh, equanimity um, in handling the situation that's been occurring in the police department over the last few months. Um, the, you're really going to be missed. I'm going to miss you. And, um, you know, had you chosen to stay, I just want to say you would have had my full confidence to continue on as uh, chief of our police department. And I am sorely going to miss you, as I believe that the rest of the council, and I believe the community will miss your leadership. And uh, I just want to thank you for your 30 dedicated years of service to the community. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, with that, uh, any other council members? Council Mayor Pro Tem Curry. 
Well, I think all of us share the thoughts that uh, Mayor Selich just expressed. And I know uh, when it was announced, you could hear the gasp of shock in the room, and that's really the same sense that many of us had and, and the sense of, no, John, don't go. And it was John saying that this is what I think is in the best interest of the city and the department, selflessly putting uh, the city ahead of his own personal interests. And I think that's the true definition of leadership. And that is why I think we have been very blessed for these past two years to have John Klein as our chief of police. He's done an outstanding job addressing the community issues, uh, being responsive to the council and the community. Uh, and I think that's reflected in the superior ratings that our police department has uh, through our community satisfaction survey. And as Mayor Ed said, I think, uh, John, you will in fact be uh, sorely missed. You know, it's clear through all of this that there are issues at the police department that need to be addressed and we are moving carefully, methodically, and fairly to both research and to address them. And uh, they go, many of, most of them, many of them have nothing whatsoever to do uh, with the chief. Uh, but his leadership has put this uh, department in, I think, a great position, and it certainly served the community well. And John, I add my personal good wishes and thanks for the great job you've done. Councilman Webb. Well, it's, it's, I'm not as eloquent as, as uh, uh, some of these other guys, <clears throat> but <clears throat> in uh, I guess at least ten years, I, I re remember. Uh, uh, going back at, at least at some of the uh, meetings that we've had and and uh, I've watched you kind of come up through the ranks too and and I know that uh, in particularly the last two years I've, I've really felt that uh, the strong leadership and the extra effort you went to to uh, serve the community and bring community issues to a head and solve those problems has been greatly appreciated so I think you've done an excellent job. Councilman Rosansky. Thank you, Mayor Selitz. Um, I'll just be brief. I've, I've already said my comments about John in public. I think he's done an excellent job as a police chief, and I, I just want to thank him for being my friend as well for the last couple of years that I've known, or five years, I guess, that I've known John. Um, you'll, you will <coughs> sorely be missed. Thank you. Councilman Gardner. Well, I'm, I'm very saddened by this. Um, when John first came on and we were having issues on Ocean Boulevard and Corona Del Mar, I mean, he put, you hear people talk about, there are all these buzzwords, and community policing, policing is, I think, in some ways a buzzword, but he, for him it wasn't. He immediately got with the residents and he understood what they, had, what they were complaining about and he responded so quickly and that told me something, that we had a new kind of, of attitude and philosophy and I so appreciated that aspect of it. And I just, it's so seldom we see in our world today someone putting himself second, not putting himself first, but putting a department and a city ahead of his own personal gain or something. And, and that's so rare. And I just I have to salute you for that. But I'm sad, very sad. Councilman Hen. Well, John. Uh it's uh, right and appropriate to focus on some of the sadness and regret here. I'm hoping uh, that you'll be very quickly able to focus on the new opportunities, new beginnings, more time with your family, a chance to strike out in new directions and continue to lead a great life. And uh, I wanted to thank you particularly on behalf of the residents of Newport Beach and especially the residents of the first district, the peninsula where you focused uh, so much good energy for the benefit of the residents in the, uh, in the bar district and in uh, helping with the various issues that we've had to deal with, special issues that require sensitive and good uh, police work to raise and maintain the quality of life for our residents. And so thank you so much for that. The, uh, I guess the highest tribute that I can offer to you uh, is that as we are looking for a new police chief by way of a permanent replacement, I will have you in my mind as a template that we should strive for in terms of your integrity and essential qualities and capabilities and demonstrated successes all the way around the horn. You'll be in my mind as we're looking for that replacement. Thank you. Councilman Daigle. 
Uh, yes, several years ago, um, um, school district trustee um, Judy Franco and I went to Chief Klein and asked for him to consider um, some community programs, and he just embraced it and made it happen. Mm -hmm. And um, those programs will live on, keep your teens safe and internet safety. So thank you for that and for all of your exceptional and exemplary service to our community. And I remember, too, um, when you first came on as chief, um, you invited me to your office and asked me, you know, what can I do for your district? How can I help? So thank you for reaching out to the um, community that we represent. Mr. Mayor, would you allow me? Yes. John, over two years ago when I went through a process to select a police chief, I was looking for somebody among other qualities, but really someone who could connect with the community. And I am just astounded two years later uh, about the strong connection that you have made with the community. I feel like you really reached out, that you never um, heard a complaint or an issue that wasn't something that you wanted to make sure that either you personally or your people gave time and attention and people were directly contacted. And 99% of the time, I think that they were satisfied. That connection has been so strong. I think that's the thing that I will remember about you the most. That and also I feel like in the two years that you have been chief, you've never uh, given me an answer that you did not feel was totally accurate. Your, your complete honesty, whether it's good or bad, but telling it like it is, not playing any games, you know, what you see is what we get with you. And I just have the highest respect for you and your integrity and the job that you've done. John, we really will miss you. Mr. Bludell, I think you uh, would like to make a statement about uh, what comes next in the recruiting for a new police chief. Yes, Mr. Mayor, it is going to take uh, you know approximately three or four months to recruit for a new police chief. Uh, chief Klein has uh, agreed to stay on at my request through the 4th of July. We're looking at uh, his last day being, I think, uh, July the 9th. So it is going to be my intention to seek a temporary chief. Uh, and I have some, uh, some names and we'll be doing some interviewing uh, very shortly and we'll be uh, uh, working with council in order to make that announcement. And then since I myself am going to be leaving in, uh, before the mid-September, uh, it, it is only right to give the city manager some time to understand the organization and make that selection. So that uh, recruitment will come at a later date in coordination with the new city manager and the city council. Uh, but uh, initially, we will uh, have an interim police chief. Okay. Uh, any comments from any council members? Okay. Thank you. Um, we will now continue on with the uh, rest of the agenda. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councilwoman Gardner, uh, followed by the invocation by Councilman Webb. Pray for your guidance. Grant to each of us the keenness of mind, clarity of vision, and unflagging determination to vigorously pursue that which is right in your sight, as well as in the eyes of all we meet. Give guidance to our mayor, our city council members, in making wise decisions that will be considerate of those who entrusted them with their office. Help us all make a positive contribution to the betterment of Newport Beach community, our county, our state, and our country. Let us understand rather than be understood. And where there is discord, let us bring unity. Help us break down barriers. Help us to widen horizons, to make us less judgmental, and to see the larger picture with a kinder conclusion. 
Thank you, God, for your presence among us. Amen. All right. Thank you, Councilman Webb. Uh, first item on the agenda is presentations. And uh, is Norm Lutz here? Is Norm here this evening? Yes, not. Uh, well, I have a proclamation that I would like to read. Um, this is uh, in regards to Norm Lutz selection as Citizen of the Year. Whereas the Newport Beach Citizen of the Year Award is presented to that individual who best represents the qualities each of us admire and respect among our friends, neighbors, and associates, and it is not given for outstanding single effort as much as for a long-term continuing commitment to the community, and it is to honor the one who has said and continues to say, Newport Beach is my home and my life and its future, and mine are the same, and whatever I can do to make it better, I will. And Norm Lotes, in addition to being incredibly active in providing leadership to the Newport Beach educational system, has been recognized for his significant involvement in groups such as the Newport Beach Chamber of Commerce, where he has participated as an active member since 1962, as well as being a Commodore, the Civil Service Board in Newport Beach, where he served as chairman from 1986 to 1987, the Newport Mesa Schools Foundation Board, where he has served as president several times, and Norm has been actively involved in Hogue Memorial Hospital Presbyterian's organization, such as its Healthcare Ethics Committee, as well as the American Cancer Society's Board of Directors. And Norm has participated as member of the American Heart Association and is a life member and board member of the Environmental Nature Center, a board member for the YMCA, a representative of the State American Cancer Society Board, worked as CFES chairman for the Taste of Newport, and a member of the Orange County Technology Foundation and the Orange County Technology Foundation for Kids. And Norm Lote's service of his country in the Navy during World War II provides an inspirational story of courage and heroic survival under the most adverse conditions imaginable. Now, therefore, I, Edward Selich, Mayor of the City of Newport Beach, on behalf of the entire Newport Beach City Council, do hereby declare Thursday, June 11th, as a day in which the City of Newport Beach and the Newport Beach Chamber of Commerce honor Norm Lotz as 2009 Newport Beach Citizen of the Year. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the City of Newport Beach to be affixed this ninth day of June 2009, Edward Selich, Mayor. So our congratulations to, uh, to Norm. Uh, it's certainly a, uh, an outstanding testament to his character to be selected as uh, this year's uh, Citizen of the Year. Um, our next presentation is the Annual Youth Council Report. Janet Cates, who is a Recreation Manager, is going to take us through this presentation. Janet. Thank you, Homer. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. Tonight we'd like to present and honor a hardworking group of young adults who have been working with the City and the Recreation Department since the beginning of the, the school year at the Newport Beach Youth Council. This year's Youth Council consists of 25 members from different high schools in our area, from Sage Hill, Modern Day, the Orange County High School of the Arts, and of course from our very own Newport Harbor and Corona Del Mar High Schools. The Youth Council helps us in a variety of ways, from volunteering at various community events to advising our department on team programming. They meet once a month, and their meetings usually feature a guest speaker chosen by the Youth Council. In addition to being educational, these speakers are career and learning opportunities for the Youth Council, but we'll have more on that later. It has been a delightful and interesting year for both Recreation Supervisor Raquel Valdez, who disappeared, and I, working with these wonderful teens on the Youth Council. And now I'd like to present one of them to you, Haley Stevens, the Vice Chair of the Youth Council, who has a PowerPoint presentation on their year's activities to share with you tonight. Haley? Mr. Mayor and members of City Council. My name is Haley Stevens and I'm the Vice Chair of the Youth Council this year. Youth Council is committed to representing the voice and viewpoint of teens while striving to benefit the quality of life in Newport Beach by creating experiences that connect teens to the community. Our responsibilities and purposes include to act in an advisory capacity to the City of Newport Beach and the City Council to provide a direct line of communication between the youth of Newport Beach and the City Council, 
provide an effective way to organize events and activities for the youth, promote youth involvement and interest in community affairs. Um, some of the things that we do during the year is Youth Government Day, Winter Wonderland. We have guest speakers throughout the year, and we do the Spring Flashlight Egg Hunt. We advise Recreation Department on teen programs and also fundraising. Winter Wonderland is really exciting. We get to watch the little kids slide down the slip sleds. Seasonal fun for over 2,500 at the Bonita, Canyon, or Bonita Creek Park on December 6th, and it's an interactive fundraising opportunity for all of us. The flashlight egg hunt was also very exciting. It's really rewarding to see the looks on the faces of all the little kids. We get to volunteer with them. That's Freckles the bunny. <laughs> it was really fun. Youth Government Day was definitely a really great opportunity for all of us. It really bridges the gap between the youth of the city and just the city government, and it's an awesome opportunity. We get to intern for a day at the different departments, for example, the Recreation and Senior Services Department, the Human Resources Department. Um, some got to shadow Council Member Steve Rosansky and the city clerk. That's a picture of me. I did the Fire and Harbor Resources Department on the right, and also there's the Planning Department. Um, we get to do a mock council meeting at the end of the city government day, which is also an extremely valuable opportunity for us. We got to um, talk about the different issues such as the Newport City Hall design amenities, the vessel anchoring in the Pacific Ocean, and the banning of styrofoam. Um, some of the guest speakers we had this year included members from the Mayor's Green Task Force, um, Greg Schwenk, the founder of the Newport Beach Film Festival and one of the first members of city council the members of the police department SWAT team and the K-9 unit, and the assistant city manager, Dave Keefe, who talked about the city hall at the park. Um, we were also recognized by the Newport Mesa Unified School District Board, which was awesome. And some of our future goals include to enhance the participation with an emphasis in individual commitment, to increase member diversity and school representation, to venture beyond traditional goals and projects to expand the year's agenda and to continue to be a positively recognized force within the community working for its benefit. I also hope that in the future we'll get to do Challenge Day, which is a great opportunity that we didn't get to do this year. And a big thank you to Council Member Steve Rosansky and to Karen Yelsky, the Newport Mesa Unified Board member. And uh, also a special thanks to Janet, Raquel, and Sean for all their hard work because we couldn't have done it without them. They really made it an enjoyable experience for us all. And now I'd like the Youth Council to please stand. Councilman Rosansky. Thank you, Mayor Selich. Um, you know, it's, it's every year the group seems to get better and better. Um, I, I thank the youth that engage in youth and government to, uh, for their commitment to just find out a little bit more about how our city works, um, get a little bit more involved with community service because at the end of the day, certainly all of us up here, that's what we're about. And uh, you know, these are our, our, our future leaders. And so um, I applaud you. I, my only regret is I didn't get to spend more time with you this year. It was a very busy year for me. But uh, I hope you got something um, out of it more than just uh, you know, another bullet point on the resume because I think it, what you did was, was important. So thank you for participating. Well, I got to attend the first part of the Youth and Government Day along with Councilman Rosansky, and I have to say I was really impressed with your, your enthusiasm and your knowledge of uh, civic affairs and uh, um, all the uh, passion that you showed for coming to City Hall and participating and with our different departments and doing the mock city council meeting. And uh, as uh, with uh, Council Member Rosansky, I applaud you for your interest and uh, hope that you continue to have a lifelong interest in civic affairs. And uh, as he said, you are the leaders of tomorrow. So thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, Councilman uh, Curry. Well, I'd like to also commend the Youth Council. I actually was a Youth Council member for Los Angeles County when I was a high school senior uh, a long time ago. 
And uh, that's where I first uh, nurtured my first love and interest in government and, uh, and uh, city government and politics and making things better. And it's really stayed with me throughout my entire life. I don't think I'd have been here today if it hadn't been for that experience uh, back uh, as a youth council member. So I applaud you all and encourage you to keep on with it and uh, keep involved in the community. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Uh, Madam Clerk. Notice to the public, the city provides a yellow sign-in card to assist in the pre preparation of the minutes. The completion of the card is not required in order to address the council. Speakers must limit comments to five minutes on agenda items. The council has a discretion to extend or shorten the time limit on agenda or non-agenda items. As a courtesy, please turn cell phones and pagers off or set them in the silent mode. Now is the time for city council announcements or matters which council members would like placed on a future agenda for discussion, action, or report. Okay. Councilwoman Daigle. Uh, yes, um, this Saturday at Corona Del Mar High School there's going to be a 5K uh, run and it was put together by Coach Bill Sumner. And it's uh, very much an alumni event and he's uh, coached a little bit over 10,000 kids. Um, and also the public is welcome. And there's also going to be a very unique uh, event, a high heel dash. And it's going to be a 100-yard run. Uh, it's open to men and women. And the heats are going to be according to gender and heel size. There's a minimum heel height of two inches. So if you're thinking about entering. <laughs> well, can't, now, can't, wasn't. I can't wear my flats. <laughs> no. yeah. Now, it's gotten a lot of media coverage in the Inland Empire, so if you are going to enter, there's going to be really stiff competition from Ontario. Uh, a lot of well-heeled people hope you can make it. That would be Saturday. Now, secondly, if you're watching City Council, um, at about 10 o'clock, something much more fun is going to be happening, and that is the Grunion Run. Um, there's a full moon on Sunday, and tonight and the next two nights, um, you're going to be able to, if you go to the darker areas of the beach, uh, see Grunion uh, come ashore. Uh, the fish lay their eggs on the sand in the warm bed of sand, and they, they'll incubate, and then in about two weeks, when we get the next splash of high tide, they'll come back into the water. So kind of a tradition if you want to see the Grunion run tonight. Of course, there is a 10 o'clock curfew on the beach. Oh, there is? <laughs> We put on a crystal cove. That's what told me about it. The Grunion greeters are loud out on the beach. They count them. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Especially yeah. if they're wearing high heels. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we can relax the beach combing in light of all the Grunions that are going to be there in the next couple of weeks, but just a request. Yeah. <laughs> Councilman Gardner. Well, speaking of 5Ks, we had the Corona Del Mar 5K. We had 500 more runners than last year, which was very good news, and it ran beautifully. I want to thank all the volunteers for such a good job. Thank staff, both the recreation staff and also general services, which got the course cleaned up so nobody even knew there had been a, a 5K there after about five minutes after the race. Then on another note, the soliciting ordinance, I know that's not a high priority, but I don't want to drop off the screen altogether. Okay. Councilman Webb. Uh, last Sunday we had a wonderful uh, parade, uh, the Balbo Island Parade. I'm taking its okay. steam again. I got to ride uh, with my four grandchildren and wife in a 1952 pickup truck. Uh, the only disadvantage that I had is we were right in front of the uh, the police department's uh, 1950 what 51. Police, and he kept blowing the siren, and I had to put my hands up. And, uh, but at any rate, that was a lot of fun, and my kids, uh, grandchildren, really liked it. Uh, recently, I've received a number of complaints about a rather large uh, backyard project in, in my district, and it seems to be a little bit out of character for the single-family residences, uh, residential neighborhood. And, and I'd like the staff to prepare a draft amendment to the zoning code for council consideration initiating at the... July 14th City Council meeting, uh, an, amend in, uh, an amendment which would accomplish the following, which is just is to establish a maximum size and term of substantial projects where a building permit is not required, allowed to be conducted in yard and setback areas. And that would be in single family residential areas. Are you talking about that project on King's Place? Nope. No. The boat on holiday. Okay. Councilman Hen. Uh, just one announcement, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this weekend will be the third biennial uh, Hogue Regatta Invitational. 
which is a very exciting series of races, five altogether, two on Friday, two on Saturday, and one on Sunday, of some of the world's fastest boats, including some Santa Cruz 70s and others. And uh, those races will be taking place off the uh, Newport Pier, so it'll be very close in. You can almost reach out and touch some of the boats as they're uh, going across the start and finish line. And so uh, this is a very worthwhile event. It's raised over $700,000 for Hogue Hospital. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to a very successful event again this year and encourage all of our citizens to come out and watch some really good ocean racing. Thanks. Councilman Rosansky? Nothing, thank you. Mayor Pro Tim Curry? Well, Memorial Day was the one-year anniversary of our 1-1 Marines Memorial in Castaways Park, and I just want to take this opportunity to commend uh, Recreation Department, General Services, Councilmember Webb, the PBNR Commission, all those involved for the flagpole that went up adjacent to the memorial. It really did enhance the, uh, the entire experience. We were up there over the weekend, and I think the entire community really appreciates those efforts. Uh, Saturday, Pamela and I were, were uh, privileged to participate in the 70th anniversary of the Newport uh, Balboa Rotary Club. Uh, they've been part of our community almost since the beginning, and they've been contributing service uh, year in and year out. Uh, they were also the people who fostered our relationship with Okazaki. So it was a real privilege to be with them and to congratulate them for 70 years of service to our community. Okay, thank you. Well, I got to uh, do the starting gun for the 5K in Corona Del Mar for the men's race, which was a lot of fun. and. Uh, that certainly is, uh, probably has to be one of the greatest 5Ks there is. The scenery there is just so beautiful when they start off. We had four women came in from New York, and they went on the city website to see, well, what can we do? And saw the 5K and ran it and had a great time. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And then Councilman Webb, I did get to ride in the Belleville Island Parade, too, <laughs> yeah, with my one granddaughter. It was a lot of fun. Rode in a 57 Chevy, or 56 Chevy, I guess it was, convertible. And uh, that's another great event that we have that kind of signals the start of summer here in Newport Beach. And, uh, you know, very, very community-minded community uh, event. And it's just like small town, uh, small town America, Mayberry, USA, I kind of call it. It's just one of our great events. And then today I had the opportunity to uh, participate in the Arbor Day ceremonies at East Bluff uh, Elementary School. Uh, we planted three golden tulip trees. I'm not quite sure what they are, but I'm sure they're pretty when they bloom. Um, the, uh, this is the 19th year in a row that uh, Newport Beach has been named uh, Tree City USA, and I think we're one of only 60 cities in the country that uh, have received that honor. So I believe that uh, Dan Serino and John Conway from our General Services Department, who are at East Bluff today, will be coming to a future city council meeting to make uh, some presentations regarding Tree City USA. Okay, Madam Clerk. Consent calendar. All matters listed under consent calendar, items 1 through 17, are considered by the council to be routine and will all be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. The city council members have received detailed staff reports on each of the items recommending an action. There will be no separate discussion of these items prior to the time the council votes on the motion unless members of the council, staff, or the public request specific items to be discussed and or removed from the consent calendar for separate action. Members of the public who wish to discuss a consent calendar item should come forward to the lectern upon invitation by the mayor and state their name and item number. If the optional signing card has been completed, it should be placed in the box provided at the podium. Okay, Councilman Hinn. I have nothing to pull, Mr. Mayor, but I did ask a question earlier in the study session regarding the comparison between uh, matching funds requested and uh, for this upcoming budget cycle compared to actual matching funds granted last year. And so, Sharon, do you have information to summarize for that, for all the bids? Yes, I do. And uh, there's a table that was distributed to you um, that looks like this. Um, the, the, the short answer is that none of the three geographic bids is asking for an increase in the matching funds from the city. Um, but I can see that it appears that way because the numbers in the annual reports are estimates based on last year's collections. Um, and I think that some background will help explain that. The city agreed to provide match to what the, the bids assess themselves about 11 years ago. Um, and $140,000 was allocated. We've never changed that sum of money. 
$40,000 of that pays our consultant who does the bid administration. He keeps the lists up to date. He does the, the invoicing, the collections. He helps in preparation of the annual renewal things. So that leaves us $100,000 to be distributed among the four bids. And we do it in proportion to how much they assess themselves and, and actually collect. Um, and we've come to do it on a five-year average because there's some variation. So the, the numbers in the annual reports that are included in your packets were estimates based on what we knew at the time. Um, and the lower right hand of the, the table that we've distributed to you now is a better estimate. But I think the thing to do is to approve those annual reports, understanding that these are estimates and they still could change as we get final numbers. Uh, the Restaurant Association is asking for an increase over what they've had before. Then I also wanted to point out that um, we distributed two um, revised exhibits. The first is for agenda item number four, the Restaurant Association renewal. Um, and that's the annual report and it shows um, what the amounts would be for um, next year's budget with and without the supplemental budget request that the bid is um, making, which you'll consider as part of the budget. So that makes it clear when you approve this annual report that it's not necessarily the higher number. Uh, and then finally, for agenda item number seven, the Corona Del Mar bid, there's um, a revision to the resolution. Um, we had um, omitted the section um, by which the council approves the annual report. Okay. Any further questions on that? Councilman Rosansky. Consent item. Items to pull. Items to pull on consent. Oh, no. <laughs> Nothing, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Curry. No items. Councilman Daigle. No. Councilman Gardner. No. Councilman Webb. Just one comment uh, that uh, the vote on, on items uh, four, five, and six, and seven related to the bids. Uh, does not necessarily indicate that we're approving any additional requests that they're making that we haven't made a decision on yet. Correct. Okay, anything from staff to pull? I have nothing to pull. Mr. Mayor, it's not on the consent calendar item, but I think this would be a good time to say item number 21, which is revisions to city water conservation ordinance. I'm going to ask at the time that we get to that, that that be taken off of the agenda and put on the next study session. Okay. I think it's a better stud study session uh, item and we still have a little work to do on it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any items that the public wishes to pull? Your name, please. Okay. I'll bring it back for motion. Move the approval of the consent calendar items 1 through 17 with the exceptions of items 3 through 10. Noting the amended uh, staff reports is distributed. Second. Okay, please vote. Motion carries. Okay, first one is item three. Hi. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. My name is Dolores Odding. I live in Newport Beach. I'm pulling item number three because I'm <clears throat> I think it's time that we need to do better on this item than we've done. Um, I know two years ago it was $160,000 to fund this little party that we have in our city every year. And I don't know what it's going to be this year, but I know that um, after it's all over with, we'll find out. And $160,000 in this economy is an awful lot of money, and there has to be something else that we can do. There isn't any other place, or why don't you guys tell us where else this kind of party happens every year? There are people that live here, live down on the peninsula, and leave because they can't stay in their own home for Fourth of July. So there's something wrong with this plan. And I know that you get together, and I know you have meetings, and, and um, it, th there just needs to be some new way to do this. Um, I understand that, it, that it's Coastal Commission. I understand that you can't close the beach, but I understand that there's health and safety issues, and I think that people are entitled to enjoy the comfort of their own home and still live in the city of Newport Beach. So um, I just know that they don't do it in Long Beach. They don't do it in Palm Springs. They don't do it down in San Diego. Um, they have parties in Long Beach where they actually have alcohol and half a million people and they don't have a problem. 
life. So whatever we're doing, I know it's made it better, but I think that we could even do better because I'm sure it's going to be $180,000 this year to have this party or thereabouts. And I know, Council Member Hem, that you're working very closely with people, and I think you do a phenomenal job. I just think that there needs to be more done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I would just make one quick comment. Uh, I think we can do better, too. And uh, at our last meeting just the other day, we agreed that uh, for the first time in a while at least, we'll, we're going to have a, an assessment of this year's results probably sometime in early September. And the purpose of that assessment will be for residents to propose specific changes that they think will make it better so that we can plan well in advance of next year. So. Okay. Anyone else want to speak on this item? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back. Move the item. Second. Okay, please vote. Motion carries. The okay, next item pulled is item number 10, on call geotechnical services, approval of professional services agreement with GMU Technic Geotechnical, Inc. Hi, thank you. Yes, Dolores Odding. And especially since we're going to have a new police chief, I think that that's great that you're going to start in September and, and really... Uh, Thank you. That's phenomenal. Um, yeah, the reason why I pulled this item is I'm kind of curious. Um, we contract out to this company, um, and I had a few phone calls with Steve Adam about another contract out. But anyway, um, and he was very kind and considerate and took care of everything. Um, we have this company now, um, GMU, that we're going to be using for on-call, and there was also something else from uh, a Harrington Geotechnical. And I have a question. When you call GMU, um, can they then go out and subcontract their work to somebody else? That's my concern, is that sometimes GMU might be busy and we're spending money with GMU, and then does GMU come and subcontract? Um, because I know that's done in other things in the city, and I really think we need to look at how that works. And that's my question. Thank you very much. I yeah. hope to get an answer, correct? Thank you very much. There will be. Uh, anyone else want to speak on this item? Okay, seeing none, um, Mr. Baden, do you have an answer to the question? I'm quickly flipping through the contract. I believe they do not have the right to do subcontracting. And Steve, they aren't the only uh, contractor that we would have this type of contract with, are they? That's correct, and, and the agreement does say that it will be permitted only with express written consent of the city. So if that was to be the case, we would have to approve it. Okay, bring it back. Okay. Second. Is there a second out there? Okay. Please vote. With Council Member Daigle absent, the motion carries. Okay. We'll go to oral reports from City Council on Committee Activities. Councilwoman Gardner. Uh, the Coastal Bay Water Quality Committee met and discussed marine protected areas. There is a commission that's working on these. It's a state law, and they're going to be designating areas. And the committee requested that there be a study session on the subject because they feel that we are going to have areas off of our coast that are designated and we have not weighed in on how we might like to see them designated. So that would be a good topic when we have some time. Yeah, I think that would be a good idea. I've received some inquiries from some of the uh, fishing clubs and uh, fishing operations in the harbor asking me what was going on in that area also. Uh, Councilwoman Daigle? I have none, okay. um, but interestingly, when I found out about the Grunion run today, I was down at Crystal Cove State Park meeting with the state biologists and all pertaining to the marine reserve issues. So I think when it does come to council, um, it will be really solid information on the science as well as um, any opportunities to coordinate with the state parks. So we are trying to roll up something that provides you with good information. Good. Councilman Webb? Uh, one of the little side activities that I have is uh, as related to uh, representing the city on the Orange County Sanitation District Board of Directors and their budget this year has uh, a little over 20 million dollars in projects that are going to occur in Newport Beach. Uh, I'll run through those quickly. It's the, uh, the Balboa Trunk Sewer Rehabilitation. This will be aligning the sewer line down the peninsula. Most of it would be work done uh, through manholes so it won't be large excavations. Uh, the replacement of the Bitter Point pump station, uh, that, uh, that contract will be awarded soon. Replacement of the Rocky Point pump station, that's out to bid. 
and probably will be awarded around Christmas time. Uh, the uh, Bitter Point Force Main replacement, that's another part of that same uh, pump station. Bayside Drive improvements, uh, this is another one where they will be lining the lines and hopefully that uh, will help take care of some of the problems the mayor has had with some odor control problems. Uh, Dover Drive trunk sewer, they will begin the design of, of the replacement of that sewer line. And then they'll be working on uh, sewer access improvements in, in the Big Canyon uh, Nature Park area. Just thought it'd be interesting to let you know that uh, another agency is going to be doing a lot of work in Newport. Okay, thank you. Councilman Hen. Um, just a quick date, uh, update on the uh, group homes issues. Uh, with regard to use permit and reasonable accommodation hearings, the Newport Coast Recovery hearing has now been combined for both the use permit and reasonable accommodation and it will be held on July 7th at 3 p.m. here in the council chambers. It's usually 4 p.m. but uh, this time 3 p.m. July 7th. And then the Kramer Center reasonable accommodation uh, hearing has been continued to June the 20, I have new contacts today and I can't read as well, June 24th at 4 p.m. Uh, here in the council chambers. And uh, lastly, Ocean Recovery, which had a use permit uh, approved uh, by the hearing officer, uh, that use permit has now become final as it was not appealed to council. And that concludes Ocean Recovery's uh, use permit undertakings. And then uh, lastly, on the legislative front, we continue to work hard. Dave Kiff uh, from the city gets a lot of credit for this, working with our, our lobbyists and consultants in Sacramento. Uh, Senate Bill 268, which is Tom Harmon's bill, uh, to add uh, requirements that will benefit not just Newport Beach, but all cities that have to deal with this problem, was actually passed by the Senate. That's the first time ever. <laughs> So applause is, uh, is appropriate, but uh, hold it uh, because the assembly still gets a crack at it and we're hoping that it'll get through the assembly too without too much change. So that's all I have. Councilman Rosansky? Nothing, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Curry? No, I just... And I have no reports this evening. Next uh, section is public hearings. Our first public hearing is item 18, the 2009-10 appropriation limit hearing. Thank you. I will call forward uh, Dennis Danner, Administrative Services Director, and in his long, illustrious career, this is going to be the last time that he will be uh, overseeing a uh, appropriations GAN limit. Uh, thank you, Homer. Uh, good evening, Mayor Selich and Council Members. There are two public hearings before you this evening uh, regarding the budget for the 9-10 fiscal year. The first one is what we call the appropriation limit hearing. It's uh, required by Article 13B of the California Constitution. It was passed by the voters, I believe, in right after Prop 13, so probably 1980, um, as Proposition 4. And what that what it uh, requires is you can only in increase your appropriations uh, that are proceeds of taxes by a combination of uh, consumer price index and population changes. So we have to go through the process every year of computing an appropriation limit. If we exceed that limit, there's remedies. We've never never exceeded it. We don't even compute any exemptions. And I'm pleased to say that uh, this year the appropriation limit is 143,000, 143,264,238. Our proceeds of taxes, 117,075,223. So you're under your appropriation limit. Uh, as a budget that was submitted to you by 26,189,015. And uh, it's required that it be approved by resolution at, at a meeting that's a notice meeting that requires a public hearing. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Councilman Curry? Well, I would just say uh, a couple things. First of all, the election actually was a special election in 1979 because I worked with Paul Gann to qualify this for uh, Proposition 4 for the ballot. The, uh, the GAN limit was actually changed twice uh, through initiatives and had it stayed the original limit that was passed in 1979, uh, the state of California today would have a budget surplus. Governor Duke Mason actually sent checks back to taxpayers uh, during the early years of the limitation and the fact that it's no longer effective in terms of restraining spending is one of the problems that the state is in now. But uh, it, it's clear that we are obviously well below uh, 
our maximum allowed spending and, and will be probably for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Okay, thank you, Dennis. Uh, anyone from the public want to address this issue? I move the recommended action. Second. Okay, please vote. Councilmember Rosansky. Oh. Motion carries. Okay, our next public hearing is the fiscal year 2009-10 proposed budget hearing. Uh, yes, Mayor Savage and Council Members. Uh, the, as per Section 1102 of the Newport Beach City Charter and Council Policy F3, we're required to submit a budget to you, I believe, 35 days before it's adopted. We submitted it to you this year, May 1st, 2009. You've reviewed the budget in three study sessions held on May 12th, which was an overview of the budget, and we went through the CIP program. May 26th, and again this afternoon, June 9th, to go over certain city issues. Also, um, I passed out this afternoon, and there was copies available for the public, a uh, budget checklist. Um, we uh, spoke about that today at the study session. I took good notes. I know that there are some changes to the checklist items. They'll be back before you on June 23rd for final adoption. Uh, the purpose tonight is to receive public input on the proposed budget for 2009-10 and direct staff accordingly. Okay. Any uh, questions of Dennis? Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll open the public hearing. Anyone that wants to address the council, please step forward. Mayor Selich and uh, members of the council. Uh, before I get going, I, with your indulgence, I'd just like to State say a few name? words. Oh, Morris. Jim Walker, I'm sorry, the bungalow and also treasurer of the uh, Newport Beach Restaurant Association. Just like to say a few words about Chief Klein. Um, and I wish he was still here, but you know, I, it certainly, certainly it was a shock to me and he's gonna be missed, but from and on behalf of the Restaurant Association and myself, um, I think he took a situation prior to his presence that was somewhat adversarial and turned it into a very open and cooperative atmosphere that we had a great exchange and a great amount of communication. And I would hope that whoever replaces him, that we can continue that atmosphere and certainly be supportive of the next chief of police and, and uh, have a good open communication. But um, he's gonna be missed and I'm sorry to see him go. Um, on, your, on your budget, uh, based on the request of the Restaurant Association, I think that there might be some misunderstanding as the initial budget request for us for um, approximately 135,000. We have since met with the board and have revised that budget, and we are asking for an increase of approximately 25,000 to a total of $160,000 for the um, upcoming Restaurant Association fiscal year. Um, you know, I, I just like to say that I've had the chance to go back and look at the different bids and, and look at the fact that the Restaurant Association has had a partnership for the city for over almost 10 years. And I think it's been a very good and prudent partnership on both sides. And I think that the investment that's been made on both of our parts has proven to be successful and hopefully will continue to be. Some of you that I've met with, and I appreciate you meeting on a personal basis and an individual basis and taking the time to listen to our concerns, some of you I haven't had the chance to meet with. But currently, <clears throat> as you well know, we are faced with a pretty difficult time right now. Uh, and in spite of that, uh, the restaurants have become basically the number one tax revenue source for the city um, at this moment. Uh, we have, in fact, moved ahead of the auto industry. We're not quite sure what's going to happen with the auto industry, but right now we are the, the number one tax contributor to the city of Newport Beach. Having said that, our industry has experienced about a 21% loss in revenues in this past year. Um, our motivation to look at increasing our budget isn't based on the fact that we look at the city council as a gift horse and a free ride. Uh, it's very much a very different agenda. Uh, we are in a really situation where I feel, and my concern is that we're gonna see a continual erosion of our base, a continual erosion of our tax base, and <clears throat> I think we need to do everything we can to try and head off that erosion. We're being challenged, obviously, by competition. We're also being challenged by the um, Restaurant Association of Orange County, which is a startup group which is now 
intending to copy some of the things that we've done, such as Restaurant Week. They've also come along with a uh, happy hour week, and um, it's, it's threatening our base. It's, it's also uh, causing some erosion in um, our ability to promote our own Restaurant Week. I'm also concerned about when we get into Restaurant Week, if we're going to be able to uh, continue the success without the, the amount of marketing that we're going to need to do. Our sponsorships are uh, becoming increasingly difficult to get. Uh, we've looked at the possibility of charging our own members more to be involved in Restaurant Week, and my concern in that is that we will lose some of our partnerships with some of our restaurants and possibly have less participation, less success. We've also looked at, and I've looked at, the fact that it's been approximately 10 years that we have um, not really changed our bid assessment to the restaurant industry. And part of our proposal tonight is to look at and to propose to our industry and to our association a increase in our assessment fees that will generate approximately 20 to 25,000 in, in additional revenue. Having said that, we would like to ask the City Council to consider partnering with us and matching those funds and um, giving us the ability to increase our marketing uh, with the 160,000 that we propose. The 20 to 25,000 that we're looking at specifically is to help us redo and increase our website and our web ability to market. The web has become an increasingly powerful tool for us. It's been quite a while since we have updated that. And um, <clears throat> I can give you a lot of statistics. I don't want to bore you with that. But the increase has been, um, you know, we get over 760 specific hits a day. And I think that it's not just um, to the advantage of the Restaurant Association, but I believe that the restaurants in Newport Beach, and particularly, and I'm speaking primarily for the independents, such as myself, that we look at the Restaurant Association as an ability to co-op and market not only our restaurants, but also the city of Newport Beach. And I think it's truly a win-win for all of us. And it brings in more people. Uh, I think the restaurants help give Newport Beach the identity and the uh, purpose for people coming here. So I would hope that you would support our, our request. Uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this point. Councilman Gardner. Uh, Jim, are you asking for a flat amount, or are you asking us to match what your additional uh, assessment of your members would be? At the moment, we're asking for a flat amount. I believe that you know our, our, our assessment revenues were actually up this year to 87,000. We're projecting that in 2009, 2010, we'll probably reach uh, about 90,000. With the additional assessment, uh, which we're looking at a couple of different ways to do that, that should generate another 20, 25,000. So we're asking for a total of 25,000, which brings the total uh, 260,000 in our request. I just wonder if, if it were a matching, whether it wouldn't help you with your marketing. <laughs> uh, it might. You know, I'm, I'm open to that. But uh, that's you know kind of what we're looking at from a number standpoint. Okay. Any other, Councilman? For Restaurant Week, what is the assessment that a the varying different restaurants would have to pay in order to be a part participant? You know, I might defer that to Peggy because she's really. Um, uh, more involved in that, but um, uh, Peggy, can you answer that real quick? For every restaurant that participates? That's correct. I'm a regular participant in Restaurant Week. I think it's great. And um, my question is more when, um, you know, you set it up, you've got your website now up and running, you've got, you know, the restaurant menus there. It would seem as Restaurant Week goes on, you know, given that some of your infrastructure is built, Already, mm -hmm. I mean, do you do you anticipate that it's going to be a continual fifty thousand dollars a week in costs? You know, I would hope that um, there's going to be some improvement in our economy and in our um, um, sales in this next year, and that um, um, that we won't have to uh, continually come and, and request that. The thing I'm concerned about, Leslie, is that right now, as you probably know, if you go out to any given restaurant, pretty much not only Newport Beach, just about anywhere, that all of us are running specials. We're cutting our prices. And 
And so we're struggling right now with what are we going to do to make Restaurant Week even more unique because we can't go strictly on a price value as we've done in the past. And so consequently, you know, we're trying to partner with the hotels. We're going to run Restaurant Week over an entire weekend, which for a lot of restaurant operators is painful. But, but I think it's a necessary thing. I think that if we're going to separate ourselves and become unique and provide an incentive for people to, in fact, participate in Restaurant Week, we have to do something more than we've done in the past. And that's part of what motivates my concern here about being able to have the ability to do that. Because without the success of Restaurant Week, then obviously everybody suffers. We suffer as an industry, you suffer as a city. And um, I think the last thing we need are, are more empty buildings and more erosion of our revenue base. And so it's, it's not a request based on, gee, this sounds good, it's a true request that I feel we need to do to protect ourselves and protect our partnership that we've had over the past 10 years. Did, did you say you were increasing your assessments? That is, nine, 10? that's what we would like to do, yes. Sharon? Yes. Well, th that's not part of the renewal for this coming fiscal Correct. year. It, it could be done in fiscal year 2010-11 as right. part of the renewal process but it wasn't part of the, the action that the council just approved for the upcoming renewal. Right. And it can't be done now since we've adopted those resolutions and we're going on to the public hearings? That's right. And, and when the um, assessment is changed, then the renewal has to be done by ordinance rather than resolution, so we need a little bit more lead time for that, too. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, I'll yeah. just do not so much a question but a comment. You know, I'm a restaurateur, as these folks well know, and most of you know, so I feel your pain. Certainly, I've seen similar, you know, um, activity or lack of activity mm -hmm. in my restaurant. And But I'm, I also sit on Economic Development Committee. And, you know, we have business people there, and we're having our executive committee meeting once a month. We have our regular committee meeting once a month, and we talk about how can we help business, how can we promote business. And I, personally, I think that there's very few ways we can as a city council. I mean, we set policies. We, you know, we try and create a good business environment where, where businesses can succeed. But in these trying times, you know, how can we um, inject um, some energy into our economy? Um, you know, I go down in Corona del Mar now. For the first time, I've seen, you know, half blocks that have vacant buildings. And it really shocks me. I see it all over town now. You know, we're, and I don't think we've seen the end of it. I think we've only kind of seen that, you know, people have been able to hang on, but a little bit more, you're going to start seeing a lot more vacancies. And we talk about, well, how can we fill these vacancies? Well, the best way to fill vacancies, in my mind, is to not have a vacancy, to support the businesses there, as opposed to try and go out and find somebody who wants to open a business in, in this kind of a climate. So, uh, you know, I, I'm sorry to hear that it doesn't look like we can achieve this increase in dues um, this year, because I really wanted to support this as a match of, of, of your commitment mm -hmm. to creating more um, funding for your programs. But, you know, for, uh, I guess we're talking about $25,000 here. I see this, I mean, I, I'm not looking to try and figure out how to make your business more successful. I think the business owners know how to make their businesses more successful. I think, you know, your natural reaction in, in hard times, and, and Mike's been involved with, you know, uh, large retailers and things is to contract and say, oh, let's stop spending marketing money because that's the easy money to, to, to not spend. But that's the most important money because that's what's going to generate your next sale. And so to me, I look at this as an investment in our restaurants, the 400 some odd restaurants that we have in this community. They are a large sales tax generator, the largest so far. Um, I think with a 20 percent drop, you'll still be ahead of the autos that are 30 to 40 percent drops in sales. So you'll probably retain your title this year. And, and I don't think it's just the restaurant association we need to look to. Maybe it's these other business associations in the city that they know how to, you know, Corona Del Mar businesses, I think they know how to generate more business. I don't want to go into somebody's business and, and try and figure out how to make their business more successful. I want to support the businesses that are here. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw my support in with you folks, hoping you. that you have the solution here. So I would support the $25,000 extra. Thank you. Councilman Hemp. You, you know, that this completely escaped me so far in my reading of the staff reports and whatnot that the, the increase in assessment that you've been talking about cannot be executed for this upcoming fiscal year. This is, 
it's a revelation right here for me in that respect. Are we certain that that cannot, that there's no path to make that happen at this juncture for the upcoming year? You know, I mean, uh, my it, understanding was it was yeah. your intent to do that. It is, and my and if there's a way to do it this year, I would certainly support that. Um, I'm not. I'm frankly, I'm not versed in it. I found out also that it was actually going to take place in um, in the year 2010. I guess it's 2010, 2011. Um, if we can do it sooner, I, I certainly will uh, do my best to support that. You know, just as an interesting point. Um, one thing I discovered is within the bid that we haven't uh, really changed for the past 10 years, 60% of the bid members claim to have 10 or less employees and they pay a whopping $50 per year. I think there's a way to move that and we have over 400 restaurants within the uh, restaurant association now and so if you were to take 400 restaurants and simply come up with a $50 increase or whatever increase that we come up with, right there is about twenty to $25,000 worth of additional bid assessment revenue. Now, how to go about doing that and, and to do it in, in such a way that it does uh, legally go through the city, I, I'm not versed in that. But I am willing as part of the board and, and part of the Restaurant Association to do what we can do, whether it's today or tomorrow, to get that done. Well, is there, is there any view from staff about the question that I asked? Unfortunately, the answer is a very resounding, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the, and I, Sharon and I have talked about it briefly, and none of us, neither one of us has addressed this particular issue before, but we can figure it out and get back to you. The, uh, if whatever happens to increase an in assessment, you have to go through the notice and public hearings and the assessment hearings as well. So that has to be noticed to the public. But there might still be time to arrange that. If, if this is something that you want to pursue for fiscal 910, so I guess the mechanism that we should have is there's an opportunity for motions for reconsideration at the end of the session whereby we could continue the item for the restaurant association for two weeks to give us time to figure that out. Well, that we don't sense? have time, do we? On do the we need schedule? to? I, I don't think that we could change course on, on the renewal that's on its way now because um, we would need the time for public notice, we would need the two readings on an ordinance which we have not been set up for and this bid is due to be renewed um, at, as of July 1st. So if we take the extra time, the bid would go out of existence for a period of time mm -hmm. and I think that's dangerous. Okay. There may be a way to increase the assessment mid-year. That was the question I asked the city attorney and neither of us has okay. dealt with that before. Well, Why can't we do it mid-August? Well, it seems to me, isn't it collected though with the, with the business license and some of those business licenses well, well, are staggered throughout the whole year. There may be some that, that are, are up, you know, July 15th. Do we need, I don't know that we need to, I mean, I'm with Steve, but I think this is something to support. And the reason I support it is not just for the restaurants, but because that kind of money is good for all of us. It's money being spent in marketing, it's money in branding Newport Beach, it helps our hotels, we get the synergy going with the Visitors Bureau and the money that they spend. So I, I think it's just money for all of our businesses. Yes, it, it helps the restaurants most of all, but it, it's got a much a halo effect so we get more bang for our buck. So even if we can't get the, the dues, the assessments immediately, obviously we want to work on that, but I think it's something that we can, I would at least support anyway. Thank you. Well, well I, would su I would support a recommendation from staff about whether or not there's a mechanism, even if it's just for a partial year, uh, <coughs> that we can pursue here. Because I think it helps your case that you want to help yourselves. Exactly. This as well. And, you know, and if, I mean, if it's helpful, if, if I'm more than available to work with Homer or whoever to, you know, work out the details and how we go about doing this, but uh, it's not my job at the moment, so I can leave it to you to figure that out. But Jim, let me ask you this question. I mean, how seriously has this been discussed at the Restaurant Association? Are, are they ready to do it, you know, ASAP? It's been discussed at our board, and then from that point we need to take it, obviously, from the board to the um, rest of the members of the Restaurant Association. The board supports it. How many members of the board? We have uh, 10 members of the board. Okay, so you got 10 400s approval already. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I have a, a, a technical question. Uh, I'm concerned that we are being asked 
to uh, set aside $50,000 in next year's budget when uh, we're trying to cut back on things and uh, handle this year's budget, uh, and uh, yet we're we're putting a little cubbyhole over here, fifty thousand dollars that isn't going to be used until 2010-11. That's happened this year, where we're having a carryover to next October's uh, uh, event. So that it seems like to me that we should only be budgeting fifty thousand dollars for Restaurant Week because we already have $50,000 for this October's Restaurant Week. We need, to, we need to fund January's Restaurant Week, and then next fiscal year we fund uh, the January and or October and January if that's the case. However, I keep hoping that these one-time requests uh, actually mean one-time requests because when we very start, first started this, it was, yes, we need to have uh, kickstart and we don't need to uh, we we eventually will get to where we can support ourselves I don't see that happening but the, the technical issue is why are we budgeting money that will be spent in next fiscal year this fiscal year I don't think we're necessarily supposed to do that well it, it does create some administrative issues and, and we had to get creative um, with the agreement um, with the restaurant association and their marketing consultant but some of the money is spent in the fiscal year before the Restaurant Week event takes place because the, the great bulk of that money is on the marketing and, and the pre-event activities. I think, and Lee should correct me if I'm wrong, that the $50,000 um, approximately carryover is not entirely related to Restaurant Week. I think it's some other things, and, and a good deal of the Restaurant Week money for the restaurant week um, early next fiscal year has already been spent in this fiscal year. Yes. Yes, to all. On the yes. Right? Yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, I, I'm concerned about that because how can you advertise for an event <coughs> in October and uh, you're spending, I mean, most of that $50,000, it would seem like to me, would go into advertising that's going to occur shortly before the event, not six months in advance. I don't, I don't understand that. Actually, a lot of it is even earlier than that because they're arranging for publications and getting co-sponsors and probably now the bid people should take over because I'm not exactly sure of but, yeah, all the work that they do. But I, I do know that um, there's a lot of lead time on, on the market. Yeah, a lot of the money is committed before July 1st. That's the problem, Don. Even though yeah. the event is not until October, they're already spending the money for publications or whatever, advertising, commitments, deposits, things like that. That's why the, originally when they came last time with the request is why we budgeted it this year for next year because they knew that they would need lead time and had to have the money committed because you can't put, you know, say you're going to put on an event and not have any money and not know until, you know, the end of June whether you're going to actually have the money for this event that's going to happen early in October. Right. And that's correct. Okay. Your, sta your staff report is very confusing because I inferred from uh, that statement that the $50,000 for the October event was being carried over. But uh, uh, I still have difficulties with us funding something in advance. Uh, I'm also a little bit, I think I could support the matching fund concept of increasing your $33,000 to $60,000, but I sure can't support it the way it is now with everybody else being asked to cut back and the Western Association turning something in and then later on, like our first staff report showed that you were the $30,000 less and you came in with a further increase of almost 25%. So that, I seem to be in the minority. Um, well, I, think I, I have a question on the, uh, Resolution we adopted tonight that set the, uh, the, the assessment and said other things, it had a lot of things in it. When we hold the public hearing at the next meeting, we can't change anything in there? We're, we're locked into that at the public hearing? The, the annual report has been approved, so un unless you it's wanted to, to put it up for, well, no, you couldn't because it needs to be published a certain number of days before the public hearing. So it cannot be changed now. And even if you, you did want to change it to 
increase the assessment, we wouldn't have time because increasing the assessment requires an ordinance instead of resolution. But there's a, a specific disclaimer saying that we gotcha. approved that, and but we did not approve the extra funding that they were asking for. That's right, and that was why we presented the, the change to you this evening that showed it with and without the supplemental budget request. The process of increasing the assessments, is how is that done? Does the board vote it and then it happens, or you have to have a vote of your membership, or how, how is that accomplished? See, my understanding, and I... You know, don't quote me on this, but my understanding is yes, the board uh, approves it, and then uh, I'm assuming it would come back uh, through channels of the city to go out to the rest of the association for their comments, their approval, their disapproval, whatever. But I think we are the ones that would initiate that uh, proposal. Well, it, well, as we said earlier, we're not sure whether it's something that can be done. I'm not in the let's middle say of we the did year, it. But yeah, the, the right way. The, I'm the just saying how is, is the, pro that, that we, the process? We need to, to provide notice to everyone who is a member of the bid that um, in addition to renewing the bid for another year, mm -hmm. the proposal is to increase the assessments. Um, and then it's, it's an assessment protest hearing, um, which is what we do for renewals, but no one protests those, at least um, in several so, years, we so haven't had more than of half the members would have to protest. In yes, order and to it's weighted by the amount of their assessment. Well, they're all oh, they're paid by their business license. Is that what it is? Uh, I think the it's the number of employees. Number of employees. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, okay. And so, so there's not an actual it's vote. It's just a. It's a, a protest, protest. Okay. and and as I said, Very it's good. an ordinance, so it's two readings at council. And it would be initiated by their board to to do that. Yes. But but it seems to me like it would be behoove the board to go to its membership, you know, before it even comes to the city to make that recommendation. It, uh, it seems like you, that, that's where the communication link needs to take place. The city is the legal process in order to make sure that process is carried through. Well, I'll just say for my vote, uh, you know, certainly I would like to see you have some skin, more skin in the game, so to speak. And if we could accomplish that, I, I would like to accomplish that. I'm confident that, you know, you're honorable people. And you're telling me that the board supports this and that you folks would support it or have your membership, you know, go out there and, and lobby for their support of it. Um, but regardless, I, I, I mean, I think it's important that you show commitment. But I also think this is a, it's a relatively inexpensive way for the city to, to give a boost to an industry that I think is very important to our city. You know, we spend money on... The Orange County Marathon, we, we just signed a contract with NOSA to do that. And these things don't really generate money for the city. I mean, maybe a few hotel rooms and things like that. But you know, we, we've spent plenty of money on other things that are good for the city. And I think this is good for the city. I think supporting our existing businesses is good. And I'd like to see other business groups come in and, 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 and let us know how we can help support them. Because this is the time when the city can do that and you know that's uh, I think we're here for to help support our uh, businesses Thank you for Tim Curry. well I would I would agree and, and I support the uh, the additional funding uh, I think it's been a good investment I think the restaurant week has really helped put the city on the map and help generate business and it's more or less paid for itself in terms of new tax revenues that it's generated so I think it's one of the things that we can do affirmatively to support our businesses and to expand our tax base uh, I would like to see some kind of report about what we need to do mechanically to effectuate this increase in the assessment. And I think it probably means that the, that the Restaurant Association needs to get its act together between now and the next meeting and get a vote taken. And then we need to look at the mechanics. I mean, we're government extracting money from people who want to give it to us is something we ought to be able to do relatively easily. And let's see if we can't get that in place this fiscal year. Okay. 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 Any other comments? I, I just wanted to point out that uh, in the report, the annual report that we approved, it does say carryover for October 2009 restaurant rate $50,000. So that's why I mentioned this. There's nothing in there that says that, that any portion of that's being spent in this fiscal year. The, this is, there, there were two attachments as part of the annual report. And, and that section is on the report on accomplishments and expenditures over fiscal year 2008, 2000. All right, I see your point. Okay, thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, thanks, Sherry. Okay, anyone else wants to address the council on the budget? 
you step um, forward. Just a clarification, though, this evening we're not, in fact, approving any budget checklist items. No, my understanding is we're just directing the staff to prepare a resolution, I think it is, to come back at the next meeting. That's right. Thank you. Okay, seeing no one, I'll uh, close the public testimony and bring it back. Do we need to take an action on that, Mr. City Manager? No, it was just a public hearing to take input. Okay, Madam Clerk. Public comments. Public comments are invited on non-agenda items generally considered to be within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. Okay. Uh, anyone wishing to address the council, please step forward. Hi. Good evening. My name is Dolores Odding. I live in Newport Beach. Um, in regards to the water conservation ordinance that's going to be coming before you, again, um, I'm hoping that you might want to think about adding the fact to I, – I think the city needs to lead by example, and one of the things that's missing in our city um, is because there's, there's, there's sprinklers broken every day in our community, and I don't think anybody really knows who to call. And I think you need to, you know how we have a graffiti hotline? Um, I think you need to have a water hotline. And one of the examples I can tell you is about, you know, San Miguel Park, which is right next door to where I live. On Saturday, I was going out at 11 o'clock, and two of the sprinklers were gurgling little streams of water into the street. And then by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they were still gurgling little streams of water. And I called the police department, and, um, you know, because I know that I'm supposed to call the police department on the weekend. And so I called the business number, and they told me they would get a gentleman out from utility because they have somebody on the weekend that does that. And I said, yeah, I know. Thank you so very much. The next morning, I'm up, and I'm leaving to go to the Balboa Island Parade. And lo and behold, the sprinklers are still gurgling, and the street's flooded. And by now, when the cars go through the street, there's a big swish noise like a lake, okay? So <clears throat> needless to say, Monday morning comes rolling around, and the, st and the street is still, there's nothing going on. When I called the police department on Sunday afternoon when I came back at around 3 o'clock, um, I was told by the dispatch people that they were told that anyone that called about the water at San Miguel Park, that there was a backflow issue, and they would be taking care of it on Monday. So I go home, and I look up backflow, and there's supposed to be all kinds of redundancy things on these things. But anyway, just the way it was said to me, I just didn't like believe in my heart that it was really a backflow issue. Well, I find out on Monday um, I had to call somebody um, um, <clears throat> over in the city hall to let them know that um, – He's, he's like in charge of the park, and I just let him know that, the, that it was going on. And um, anyway, the bottom line is that they didn't turn off the water. They left the water on. We're supposed to be conserving water. Um, it's a restroom issue, and also the baseball diamond over there was flooding, so it's another issue. There are a couple of problems. They uh, turned off the water Monday. They got some um, porta potties so that people could use the restrooms because that was one of the problems. And then today they were fixing it, and somehow the valve got broken, and so utilities had to come out. And I think maybe utilities should have come out to begin with to turn off the water for the plumber that was there. And you guys have all these things you do, like benchmarks and everything else, but in the meantime, we had water running four days, four nights and three days, and we don't have extra water. And so a good thing to do would be to make a determination that you don't water any city municipal areas on the weekend, because if you don't water them, then they don't break, and then we don't have to worry about all this stuff. But this is like a major issue, and it's not the first time the park has had problems. I know I'm out of time. I, I appreciate it very much, and so I would like you to consider things that you're going to be adding to your ordinance, and that should be one of them. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Any other public comments? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll go on to our next item, which is Planning Commission Agenda for June 4th, 2009. Mr. Mayor and members of City Council, good evening. Uh, we had four items on former week's Planning Commission. Uh, the first one I'm sure you all recognize, the area project, the you know, condominiums uh, proposed for Carnation Avenue at Ocean and Corona Del Mar. A, the recommendation of the Planning Commission to the City Council was to certify the EIR and to approve the project and in its current formation. Uh, this will be coming to you folks on the 14th of July for your action on that project. Uh, next was a uh, 
review of the preliminary capital improvement program for the 2009-2010 fiscal year it's required by the government code as well as by city charter planning commission find is consistent with the uh, general plan the coastal land use plan they did and the report uh, will be forwarded to the planning commission or to the city council at the meeting of july 14th uh, general plan land use element corrections uh, you may not remember but back in 2006 your resolution uh, adopting the general plan did direct staff to go ahead and make corrections of typographical and scrivener errors uh, with the requirement that the Planning Commission affirm those changes. There were four land use changes that were made. The uh, Planning Commission did affirm those. And lastly, there was a status report on the uh, operations of the once proposed Panini Cafe on uh, Coast Highway in Corona del Mar. Uh, there was to be a one year review after commenced operation. Well, when the tickler came up, there was one year since it had been approved. We thought we'd just go ahead and report back that the operation has not been commenced and it doesn't look like it will be. So. Probably not going to need any further review. Okay. Any questions for David? Thank you. Okay. Next is continued business uh, revisions to city water conservation ordinance. Mr. Mayor, this is the one that I said that I'm going to ask to be taken off of this uh, calendar and uh, relocated to the study <coughs> session on the 23rd. Okay. We entertain a motion to that effect. So vote. Thank you. Second. Okay. Any public comment? Please vote. Motion carries. Okay, current business is next. Item number 22, annual review and update of strategic plan for fiscal and economic st uh, stability. Mr. Mayor, um, this strategic plan was first adopted by the council in uh, 2007, and it contains objectives that say that we are supposed to provide regular reports to the Economic Development Committee and to the city council as to um, our progress um, and any um, need for additional resources to complete the programs. Um, this is the first annual report because we got a slow start with some staff vacancies. Um, and a subcommittee of the Economic Development Committee worked with staff on both the annual review and the proposed changes to the strategic plan. Um, the plan has a total of 79 action steps and our review shows that of these, 63 of them have either been completed or are in progress or are ongoing activities. So um, we think that we are making good progress on it. And, and we also think that the strategic plan is a good thing to keep updated because it's been a, a good way to set priorities for us. Um, and as part of the review, um, the Economic Development Committee is recommending some updates and these are mostly to delete programs or action steps that, that have been completed, to change timelines for, for things that um, may have fallen behind um, and there are a couple of new ones added. Those are shown in your agenda packet in underline and strike out and the six of the most significant changes are outlined in the staff report. Um, once again, we've done um, a spreadsheet showing the staff resources and um, whether we have enough to, to complete the plan um, as it's been updated or do we have a surplus of staff. Um, and based on our estimates, we think that we are still in good balance. We can keep up with this work program. Um, and there might be a little bit of surplus in staff hours in a couple of the months. But what our experience has shown us is that it gets filled up with um, projects that come along, such as the um, styrofoam ban ordinance, which the economic development staff took on. Um, we've also analyzed and estimated what we would need for consultant resources to complete um, what's programmed for um, the upcoming fiscal year. And our estimate was a total of 51 to $60,000. Um, and the recommended budget had um, $42,000 in the Economic Development Division. And so the Economic Development Committee recommended that $15,000 be placed on the Council's budget checklist, which you did this afternoon during the study session. So I am available for questions. Okay. Councilman Daigle? A uh, couple questions on the references, the listing services. Um, are there any measures in place that demonstrate if they're actually performing? Are you referring to our information from CoStar? Um, it says real estate. Um, yeah, CoStar. CoStar. Yeah. Yes, we, 
it's, um, it's a subscription service, so they don't provide to us regular reports, but they update their online resources, I believe it is monthly, and they do it from listings that are available as well as driving around town and, and seeing where we have vacancies. And then we are able to produce our own reports from that information so we can define the geographic area and ask for information on number of storefronts that are vacant and available, amount of square feet. We can look at a, a particular property and get some information on it. So we have found it to be very useful so far um, just as we have had potential businesses come to the city and so now we have a way of saying well here is something that is available and you might be interested in. Um, to provide um, the reports as we did recently on how the economy is doing. And then in conjunction that with the work that we had done by Buxton, which looked at um, demographics within a certain drive time of Newport Beach and what kinds of businesses um, we might be able to draw, we paired that with the information on what kinds of commercial spaces we have available so that we could do our recruitment efforts towards companies that would have a chance of actually locating in these areas. Okay, I guess my question is more along the lines of is it resulting in office in space being filled up or is there really different problems that people aren't utilizing the space or renting the space? I would have to say that at this point I don't think we've been successful in, in attracting a tenant to right. um, a vacant space, but business recruitment takes time. And then my other question is on the Ryan Wharf float. Um, is that really going to happen in 2009? We're going to bid that out? We discussed that. Steve, did you hear that, the Ryan Wharf? Uh, it, it's a CIP project, isn't it, for this year? Yeah, it's a CIP project. It's in process. Right. I remember being assured and guaranteed by Mr. Batum that it would, in fact, happen in this upcoming year. So. That's the way I remember September it, September we go to contract. <laughs> okay, any other questions yes. to staff? Oh, Councilman Gardner. Um, this is not so much to staff, probably, but to the members of the, of the committee. Uh, objective 7.4, private alternative transportation. I agree. I mean, we've, it's been tried and it hasn't worked. But I was just wondering if the EDC might not be an area to start with. We're, we're losing this, all this bus service, and obviously that impacts a lot of our workers, and they're the workers that can least afford to be impacted, and the more help we can give them as far as transportation, the better off for our businesses. And you know, there's always carpooling, but the problem is that I may work in a small business, and I live in Fullerton, and nobody else in the business lives in Fullerton, so that's sort of, that's the end of it. But perhaps the, with the in, impetus from the EDC and the chamber getting involved, it might, perhaps a clearinghouse of some sort could be created that people who, employees who need some kind of transportation could send it, I live here, and, and there could be some central point that we could, that we could help with that, or the count, uh, chamber could, or something like that, to just provide some assistance. You mean like a ride share Craigslist? <laughs> yeah, sort of like that, I suppose, but I mean, I, I, I just... I think SCAG has something like that. I think there's a ride share um, like bulls and boards, yeah. yeah. And probably least, a very large at least plans used to be. I don't know. <laughs> right, but but the problem the problem I'm seeing with Skag and things like that is a lot of our businesses <laughs> never heard of Skag. I mean, but they have the chamber. A lot of them are members of the chamber, and that would be a way to get at least in touch with them as far as starting ideas. I throw that out there. I'm not on the EDC. I don't think Coastal Bay is up to it. <laughs> Okay, uh, anyone from the public want to address the council on this issue? Okay, seeing no one, I'll bring it back. I think since we've already received, we receive and file the annual review and we've already done the uh, budget checklist, so I think the only action is to approve the proposed updates to the strategic plan. So I'll entertain a motion to that. So moved. Second. Okay, please vote. With Council Member Webb absent, the motion carries. Okay, next item is item number uh, 23, Proposed Assessment District, number 103, area generally bounded by G Street, East Bell Bowl Boulevard, Channel Road, and Ocean Boulevard. 
Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, my name is Iris Lee from the Public Works Department. Um, uh, the item that we're presenting here today is in regards to Assessment District 103, and um, as you just mentioned, it's the area bounded by G Street, Ocean Boulevard, uh, Channel Road, and Balboa Boulevard. Um, we're presenting three resolutions tonight for adoption, uh, the first one being adopting a preliminary boundary map. Um, number two is the re resolution of intentions with proceedings for Assessment District 103. And the third resolution is giving preliminary approval to our engineer's report, uh, setting a time and place for a public hearing, and um, directing the notices and ballots to be mailed out. Um, I, item number two on the, um, the staff report is to uh, approve the professional service agreement with uh, myers Nave to provide bond council services. Um, assessment District 103 um, was proposed back in spring of 2005 by the property owners who submitted petitions and general funds were allocated uh, for utility design. That amount was uh, amounted to approximately $238,000. And um, in spring of 2009, the utility companies bidded out the project and provided the city with a guaranteed cost, uh, guaranteed construction cost amounting to $3,367,477. And um, this construction cost basically includes uh, all the constructions in um, the public right of way and providing a service step out to each property, um, including uh, design constructions and all the financing inc incidental costs. We're looking at a total district cost of um, $6,245,000. And that amount does not include the ITCC tax. Um, this total assessment amount was um, allocated to each of the assessment district 103 parcels based on the assessment engineer's uh, recommended methodology. This methodology is based on parcel size, which includes specific benefits of aesthetic, safety, and connection. Assessment ranged from approximately $6,200 to $56,000, um, with over half of the parcels assessment under $15,000. We're looking at um, a median range of between about fourteen dollars to $19,000. There's typically a majority of properties fall into that range. And um, upon approval of uh, the resolutions, um, ballots will be mailed out. And a public information meeting is going to be held on June 30th with a public hearing date set for July 28th where the ballots will be tabulated. And if the district is approved, we're anticipating construction to start in September. And uh, we have our bond counsel, Sam Sperry, and Joan Cox, our assessment engineer, for questions and answers. Okay, any uh, questions? Uh, Councilman Curry. I just want to acknowledge the presence of Sam Sperry, one of California's most experienced and esteemed bond councils. David, we're definitely moving up the bond council food chain, so I welcome you to our city. Okay, Councilman Hen. Yes, uh, I'm uh, generally uh, fine with the report that's been submitted. However, there is uh, some question with regard to the Channel Road properties, with regard to them receiving a full assessment. And I've had some conversation with uh, folks about that, and I understand uh, the rationale that's been presented. However, I'm also troubled by the fact that there may have been some impressions created to the contrary for those homeowners, and I do want to continue to uh, delve into that issue so that we're certain to our satisfaction that we're getting the correct outcome here. And I do regard this as a unique situation. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not challenging the judgment of our engineers here, but I am concerned about potential for miscommunication uh, regarding this issue and I will be wanting to look into whether or not there's any action that's appropriate uh, to address that issue before we finalize this. Um, I'm not going to propose that we change the report tonight, but I do want to follow up with this over the next few days and uh, understand precisely what can or, or should be done about it. So with that, I, do we have any, you know, uh, I, I think, in particular, we need to understand uh, representations that have been made to these homeowners in the past and whether or not in the last assessment district report for Channel Road there were commitments made regarding credits from this assessment district. That's the very specific issue that I want to make sure of. So. Let me ask, uh, right now we're scheduled to send these ballots out tomorrow? Is that By what Friday. the plan is? 
Is there is there any uh, room here in the schedule to defer that a day or two? Until I've had a chance to really understand this issue? Um, if you don't move forward with the assessments today, approve the report and move us forward and approve the resolutions, then we can't mail the ballots. So um, I guess if we get direction maybe at the next council meeting, it just shifts us back. Um, and there's no problem with doing that to have you comfortable. Um, but um, it's my understanding that unless you approve the resolutions as stated, as provided to you or may modify the report in some manner today, we will not be mailing ballots out mm -hmm. on Friday. Because the public hearing, it's the 45th day before that public hearing, and that's our requirement to mail them out by Friday. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question? If, well, I think so. If we were to continue this uh, <laughs> for two weeks, what impact does that have? Um, we have already built in a full years of funded interest in the budget, so really there's no impact on the assessments. Um, we have been debating if we could actually get them on the tax bill this year. It would be a lot of maneuvering to do that. There's a possibility. It's not a guarantee by any stretch of the imagination. This would pretty much probably, if you move this back, we would not have that option to put them on the tax bills. We'd just go to the next year. <coughs> And okay. what's the result of that? I mean, what's the impact of that? The impact is that you'd actually use the funded interest. You would be forming the district and selling the bonds, and you wouldn't be getting your payments until the next property tax bills. So you have to have some interest funded with it. So it's an additional cost to the assessments. We've already built that cost into your cost estimates, so just in case. So there would be no impact? Not, not visibly, no. Of the deferral. What about the construction schedule and other issues associated with a two-week deferral here? Um, based on our schedule right now, we're looking for uh, construction to break ground uh, after Labor Day, pushing it back by a few weeks, basically pushes construction back by a few weeks as well. Um, I'm anticipating that we should not have a problem finishing it by Memorial Day. Um, simply pushing it by a few weeks. So really, really no, no impact. I guess there's no real impact then by shifting it by delaying two weeks. Do well, we don't, you, don't you lose that the cushion, though, of that year's interest reserve, though, because you use it up up front as opposed to having it at the back of the district? I mean, that there is an effect. Well, I, I think she said that there is an additional cost, but that cost it, that money is available for that additional cost if we want to do that. It's already in yeah. there, and that's part of people pay off their assessment within that 30-day cash payment period. They get a 13% discount because we funded all that interest. Uh, we had all that interest taken into consideration. Um, and it's 13% because we anticipated the possibility of having to have that interest for the next year. So. Well, suppose we approved it tonight. You've got this funded interest in the estimate. What happens to that if that money isn't used? Um, then it would uh, be reduced the total lien on the property, and that assessment would be lowered. We'd actually come back to you and have an uh, amended report once we knew we could get everything on the tax bill and have those liens actually lowered is my understanding of how it would work. So if I'm understanding this correct, the sort of the, the real impact is you have capitalized interest for a year that has to be funded and is, is spread over the tax roll. And we think you have enough cushion based on an assumption that some people are going to prepay and that's going to free up some money that would be used for capitalized interest. Is that accurate or am I a little off there? But one way or the other, if you have a year of capitalized interest, I mean, that's, just, that, that's a cost. It, it is, and, and if we knew we could get them on the tax bill, we would be basically reducing assessments at the time you're selling bonds. And, and, but the ballots would go out exactly the same no matter what. Right. But the homeowner could pay less than slightly. Is that right? Slightly, yes. Okay. Now, what are we talking about uh, in percent? Uh, Two percent, one percent, half a percent? Um, we have, I believe, 6% built in, about 6% built in. Okay, so they could get a reduction of probably after figuring out everything, maybe 5%. Sure. They cash and get even more. But, and again, at this point, there's no guarantee we can actually get them on the tax bill. We're hoping we can if we go now. 
but we provided that cushion just in case we couldn't. So it's still a little up in the air about whether or not we can actually make it on the tax bill. Tax bill ends, uh, we have to submit everything by August 10th. We're not going to be finished our cash payment period until the end of August. So we'd have to be maneuvering a little bit to get everything on the tax bills. Um, and, and so it's just not, not a, a sure thing that we can actually not use the capitalized interest. Could, could you give us a, an idea of the, of the question that you have, Mike? Well, there are seven properties on Channel Road that had a, uh, that were a part of a prior assessment district. And at the time of that assessment district, uh, they were charged approximately $7,000 for the benefit they received, which was to be able to have a clearer view of the bay. They did receive an assessment that was lower than it otherwise would have been because they did not get the benefit of a connection or, in effect, a safety benefit. They only received a benefit for having a more clear view of the bay. And now we have a new assessment district coming along, and that assessment district is basically interior to the point, to Peninsula Point. And those homeowners will get a benefit because they will be connected now to the undergrounding service and presumably would have a safety benefit from the removal of the poles. And I suppose to the extent the poles are in their alleys behind their houses, arguably are receiving an aesthetic benefit. Uh, but the engineer's uh, conclusion is that the prior benefit was a separate benefit that they received for which they were charged, and this is a separate new undertaking under this new assessment. Setting aside the correctness of that rationale, there is a question about whether or not those homeowners were told uh, once before first that they would, the, f the first time, that they would get a credit against future assessment districts because they paid an amount earlier. And I, I would like to get to the bottom of that because I don't want anyone to have a feeling that you know, this wasn't all done completely appropriately. So that's the issue. It seems like to me we need to continue this for two weeks in order to resolve that. Well, but, but I mean, I, I just, I'm sympathetic with that, but I'd also, I mean, I don't know, if I were one of the other homeowners and thinking I might be saving 5% or something because we were going to get things moving along, um, I would be interested in the council doing that. <laughs> So now I guess the other alternative is to approve this tonight, let the ballots go out, and then still address this issue to determine what's the right answer and see if there is a remedy that's appropriate if the answer leads us to a conclusion that something should be done. I, I may be sticking my nose where it doesn't belong, but it, it seems like if there is some benefit given, then doesn't that increase everybody else's uh, cost? Well, it, it depends on how you, um, how the council directs a change in the assessment for these seven properties. And just to, I think the confusion comes with the term credit. Um, in District 64, a credit was actually a discount at that time. These properties actually received a $2,500 discount on their assessment in District 64 in anticipation of the future undergrounding that was going to take place at some unknown point in time. So their assessment was actually discounted at that point in time and it was very specifically stated in that report. And I think the term credit, which was used, it was a credit against that assessment which reduced it. The term credit is what is causing confusion, but it actually was discounted at that time by $2,500. Um, and to answer your question, if the council directed that these seven properties had a reduction in their assessment amount, um, I think it would be probably best not to increase anybody else's assessment but just to make a reduction in those so, um, and Sam, maybe you could answer this better, but so that we could say that no one is paying more than their proportional share of the benefit. Um, these properties are paying less, these seven properties, but no one is paying more than what was originally determined to be their fair share of the benefit. And what that would do is would basically take us out of contingency. The other thing the council could do is actually contribute to those properties if you wanted. That would probably be the cleanest and make a contribution to reduce those assessments. But so they I, have already received their discount the first time around. In my opinion, yes, and I thought it was clearly stated in, in 64's report. 
But the question is, have there been representations right. beyond that to the effect that they would get a credit, an additional credit in future assessment districts? That's what I don't have a clear view of at this point. And by what mechanism those homeowners might have that impression. So um, maybe it is best to continue it to work that out. Are you well, think so? Well, <laughs> I still, as I say, I'm thinking of the, the fact that I know it's a we're, we're, we're not we're not guaranteeing that we can get it on there, but still, that is a savings if we do. And well, but uh, but let me ask a little further then. So we think there might be a mechanism for remedy here if it's appropriate, even if we decide to go forward tonight. Bond council is shaking his head yes. Uh, yeah. There are potential remedies for this situation. If we do agree at, at the end of the day that there is there's a need for a remedy. If we agree yes. there's a need. Yeah. And I think you know maybe some of the confusion is that let's just assume that District 64 never happened and it was happening right now. Those homes that have the Bay View would have ended up having a higher assessment than all the other homes in the district. So in essence, they are getting a credit in, the, in that they've paid in advance. And I'll, I'll stick my neck out a little bit here. I would guess that the price they paid then would be a lot cheaper than it would be right now. But they did receive a credit in essence because a portion of what, if it had been one big district, they've already paid that portion. So like you said, it just might be what they heard or what they think they've been told, well, that's and maybe we do need to spend some time and talk with that's them. That's what it. we need to get to the bottom of. Mm -hmm. And whether or not there was a misapprehension that it, that the city had any contribution to, and so I want to understand that very clearly. And I'm going to take it faith that there are, if we conclude that there are remedies available by law that we can elect to to use here to fix that problem. You don't have to take it by faith. You can mo modify the assessment based upon actions that at the protest hearing. Uh, it, I, I agree with the assessment engineers. We wouldn't recommend increasing anyone else's assessment because it creates a, an accuracy of the spread of the assessment issue. I, I hadn't thought of you actually crediting. I think that's a great way to do it that involves, that avoids any kind of risk with respect to an inappropriate assessment. Uh, alternatively, I suppose you could also debit against your contingencies. I'm not sure Public Works would want to do that, but I would recommend against increasing anyone else's assessment based upon this concern, though. You see, this is a unique situation here. We're not challenging the engineer's uh, judgment what we are challenging is whether or not there's an equitable outcome here based on representations that have been made outside of the engineer's report here. That's unique. How, how much are we talking we about per lot credit potentially? Um, that is at the discretion of the city council. Um, my analysis says they don't get one. So it's really at your discretion what you think. Um, well, let me answer that question. <laughs> yeah, maybe you're the one that I should be asking. So that, so that Mrs. Cox doesn't have to you know, impugn her own integrity here. Um, my view of it is that the, that the current assessment for those seven homes is in the range of $16,000. And that uh, the prior assessment they paid was $7,000. Um, you could take the view that uh, they've already received an aesthetic benefit and they're not getting much, if any, of, a, of an aesthetic ben benefit from the new assessment district and therefore maybe they should get two-thirds of an assessment. That would be roughly a credit of $5,000. Or you could take the view that, depending on what we find out, that some different number is appropriate. But that's the range we're dealing in here. Times seven. There are seven homes. Okay, $35,000 or so. It's, it's really, in the total scheme of things, de minimis. If it were reallocated to everyone else, it would be like $90 a house for the rest of the district. It's but, but I don't think, you know, uh, we, we just want to make sure that we've thought this through correctly and that everyone is being treated correctly as well as we can determine. Well, from what I understand, we can do that. So I would move the, mo move the action. Second. Okay. And having uh, thought it through, I, I would agree with that. Okay. Uh, anyone from the public want to comment on this item? Step forward.
wants this? Anybody? Just lay it on top of there. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Joe Perring, and uh, I'm a resident of uh, Peninsula Point and one of the people that uh, worked to gather signatures for this uh, assessment district uh, a long time ago. And so we're pleased uh, that we are here tonight, and we want to compliment the city staff, the assessment engineer, and others that have, uh, have worked uh, long and hard to get us to this point. Um, we're, uh, I'm very interested in pursuing uh, Councilman Hen's point, uh, mostly because uh, these things, as we know from recent experience, uh, don't happen automatically. And there's seven uh, property owners that, uh, if they have a beef, uh, could turn into a no vote that could very just as easily be a yes vote. And, uh, and so uh, we don't want to lose this election by seven votes. And so being cautious about how information is presented to people when we go ask them for their vote, um, as you know as politicians, is a very important matter for us as people that are out there working the streets to make this thing happen. So we, we're very, I, I'm very much in favor of, uh, of seeing that happen. Um, uh, I, can, uh, I can tell you that there are a, a large group of folks who signed the petitions to begin with. Many of those signatures I collected myself. I've uh, been uh, asked on numerous occasions over the years since, what's going on with the assessment district? And it, gives me, it will give me great pleasure to, to tell them that the, the, uh, the ballots are on the way. So uh, our, uh, our hope is that uh, you would uh, vote yes on these resolutions this evening and move us, uh, move us ahead. I do have one question, though, that, that was made a little unclear by the earlier conversation about the uh, capitalized interest. Um, it, it is an amount that, uh, that has been uh, included in the budget, as, as I understand it from this evening, uh, that uh, may or may not be needed. And um, when, um, when we're talking to people about a matter of $15,000 or $14,000 or $16,000, I can tell you that all of those amounts are higher than they were led to believe when we got the signatures many years ago. And so every thousand dollars that we increase our uh, our budget is an important thousand dollars. And if we're going to use the money, then fine. I don't mind asking for it. But if it's money that's just been included to give us some extra breathing room, uh, then I, I think that we, we need to rethink that because it's important as far as getting the vote is concerned. So maybe a little more conversation about that would be appropriate. If, uh, Like I said, if we need it, fine. We'll ask for it. But but I, I don't know how to I don't know how to talk to people about that uh, that part of the budget. So uh, uh, that concludes what I have to say, and I'll sit down and let you guys. Yeah. Well, I think it's a timing issue as to whether this assessment district gets done fast enough that the uh, county tax collector can get notified in time and get put on the tax bills. Is that correct? I understand that point. I understand that point. But but uh, um, I also understood us to say that uh, that. Um, that it could just as easily be the first year of interest. And so, uh, you know, another way to talk about this with folks is the first year of interest payments, our first, our first annual tax payment for this is included in the amount that we're paying now. So we don't have a payment until the year, you know, what is it? I, I always get confused about this, 20, 2011, 10 or 11. So, so that's, that's an important distinction that, that, I, that, that to, to my mind would be worth clarifying before we go out to, to sell the, the uh, uh, before we go out to, to campaign for the votes. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, I, I think we will, we can clarify that, uh, perhaps even quantify the potential for well, well, we difference uh, for people. It's, it's I did have one further question uh, for the folks that are organizing this for us. Uh, when those ballots go out, is it possible to identify on the ballot the Prop, the, it, for those that choose not to pay cash in advance, is it possible to quantify an estimate of what the monthly property tax increment would be for those that choose not to pay cash in advance? And perhaps our esteemed bond council can address this. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Sam Sperry of Myers Nave, uh, your bond council for these proceedings. Uh, two things to say. I had a conversation this afternoon with one of the city attorney's deputies about that very topic uh, and 
said, number one, I believe that it's probably not lawful, meaning it's information that we're not entitled to put on the ballot. And I would, as your uh, legal advisor, strongly advise against it, even if it was lawful. We want those property owners to have that information. And I can absolutely assure you, unqualifiedly, they will hear that information at the property owner information meeting we're going to be having with them on June 30th. Uh, we'll have that information available. It will be an estimate. But what we want them to see on the ballot is the specific information as to which they're saying yes or no. Uh, and that's prescribed by the state constitution under Prop 218. That seems like a clear answer. <laughs> Does it get much clearer? One other, just let me comment. I, while we were sitting there, marked four line items in the budget. I think you heard that if we were to reduce assessments, and I'm not trying to prejudge the outcome of that discussion, um, by some amount, and I heard an estimate quickly of $35,000, we then simply need to identify a corresponding amount in the cost estimate to be carved out and thereby reduce the budget by that corresponding amount. I've identified some light items that let us get there very quickly, and one item that I'm very familiar with is the estimate of our compensation. It's in the report for $67,000. Before you tonight is the proposal to approve our legal services agreement for not to exceed 25. There's your 35,000 right there. <laughs> That's the best thing I've heard in I can't remember when. We're going to pay the lawyers less? Huh? Huh? <laughs> I'm not sure I like this. Let's go back. I We're going to have you back. Just as a clarification, the cost estimate actually identifies bond council as $25,000 and not sixty-seven. dollars Sorry. Then oh. you're not automatically invited back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other public comments? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back. For vote. Um, one thing to let our citizens know, because I asked the public works director, is the city's not casting a vote because we don't own any property beyond some pocket, pocket, parts, pocket parks that are not subject to the assessment. Okay. okay, please vote. Oh. The motion carries. Okay, now, next item is item 24, transfer of development rights in North Newport Center Plan Community. Jaime Murillo is going to provide the staff report for this one. Thank you, Homer. Good evening, be Mayor, better. members of the council. Uh, this item is regarding a transfer of development rights within the North Newport Center plan community. To provide a little background, the plan community was approved by the council in 2007 and establishes the development regulations for the four sub areas that comprise the plan community area, including specific development limits and a procedure that allows for the transfer of development rights between the sub areas. Uh, the current proposal involves a transfer of 241,711 square feet of general office use from San Joaquin Plaza subarea to, to Block 600 and a transfer of 85,756 square feet of general office use from Block 500 to Block 600. The procedure set forth in the planned community development plan states that the City Council shall approve a transfer if it finds a transfer will result in no more trips and no greater intensity of land use than development uh, without the transfer. Since the transfer does not involve the conversion of use, uh, there is no change in intensity. To analyze the trip generation, the city retained Austin Faust Associates to prepare a traffic analysis. The traffic analysis found that the proposed transfer actually resulted in a net decrease in overall PM peak hour trips and that no adverse traffic impacts would result from the transfer as proposed. Uh, therefore, consistent with the general plan and plan community development plan procedures, staff is recommending that the council approve the proposed transfer. Uh, it should also be noted that the Irvine Company is proposing to reassign 430 residential units previously approved in Block 600 to San Joaquin Plaza. Since the general plan and the Newport Center plan community allow the development of units within either of the two blocks, a transfer of development rights is not required. Uh, however, consistent with the development agreement that was adopted for the development of Newport Center, the relocation of units was reviewed for compliance with the city's traffic phasing ordinance. 
the traffic analysis prepared by Austin Faust found that the proposed change in location was trip neutral and did not result in a change in uh, vehicular traffic pattern in the area. Uh, therefore, the city traffic engineer determined that the preparation of a new traffic study was not required. Um, I would like to point out that the staff report and draft resolution including your packets did include an error uh, regarding the request from block 400. Uh, the staff report incorrectly stated that the request was for 84,911 square feet. However, as stated in my presentation, the correct amount is 85,756 square feet. Um, I would like to reassure the council that the traffic analysis prepared by Austin Faust did analyze the correct number. Um, I've provided the city clerk with a revised resolution as well. Um, that concludes my report. Um, I'd also like to state that Joe Faust from Austin Faust and Associates is in attendance tonight and available to answer any questions with regard to the traffic analysis. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Jaime? Okay, thank you. I'll open the public hearing. Does anybody feel compelled to come forward? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to council for motion. Move the item. Second. Okay, please vote. Motion carries. Okay, next item is uh, item S25, Ordinance 2009-13, amending the subdivision ordinance, uh, Title 19 of the Municipal Code relative to lot line adjustments. Mayor and members of City Council, uh, this amendment would, as you've indicated, revise our subdivision ordinance. And I think a little background probably is in order to help you understand uh, how this came about. I think time is going to help me here try and find the exhibit that, that will show you exactly what's happening here. There are two important concepts here. Uh, one is the fact that we've got that's the one. Oh, yeah, put it up, please. Um, the fact that our zoning code has a minimum lot size of 5,000 square feet, uh, whereas in most cases in the peninsula, we don't have 5,000 square foot lots. We have something more akin to what you see here, 2,100 square foot lots. Um, the second item is that the way our ordinance is currently structured, in cases such as this, and this is the typical one where this has come up in the past, where uh, you would ordinarily want to use a lot line adjustment just to rotate the lot line essentially and change which street becomes the front street for the property. Problem is, uh, because our current ordinance requires that you comply with the zoning requirements, meaning you have to have a minimum 5,000 square foot lot, you have to do a parcel map, which is a lot more money, requires the engineering, requires the surveying to accomplish this very thing. So understanding that most places on the peninsula, for example, where you have a non-conforming lot, lots are non-conforming as to size. They don't have 5,000 square feet. We said, well, you know, we can go ahead and change the ordinance to allow you to rotate this and use a simple lot line adjustment uh, with at, by adding the provision that says, if this is what you're doing, if you're doing a lot line adjustment, rotating the orientation of the lot line, for example, and your lots that result from the lot line adjustment are no more non-conforming as to frontage and as to area than the lots that you began with. You're good to go. You don't have to do the parcel map. So in this case, for example, on the left, this is what we started with. And this, again, was the best example we could come up with where this comes into play. And I know over time, I think uh, the mayor's called us about it. I've talked to Council Member Hen about it. Uh, when these have occurred in their districts. Uh, typical case, uh, front street, lots are oriented. Each lot has 30 feet of frontage on what we're calling the front street. Each lot is 2,100 square feet. Uh, generally, because of views toward the water, the owners want to rotate that lot line. Uh, again, because the lots are non-conforming as to size, they're not 5,000 square feet, and typically as to frontage, they don't have 50 feet of frontage, the only way to accomplish that under current code is to prepare a parcel map. So we recognize that, gee, you're never going to have 5,000 square foot lots resulting. So to get to the resulting lots shown in the second, uh, in the right half of the slide, we said, okay, you can now accomplish this by a lot line adjustment if you revise or adopt this code revision. 
because we're accepting. We're saying you can do this with a lot line rather than a parcel map as long as your frontages are no more nonconforming. In other words, you've gone from 30 feet minimum frontage here, you've got at least 35 feet over here in the resulting lots, and you're no more nonconforming as to square footage of the lots. Left, you started with two lots, each 2,100 square feet. After the lot line adjustment, you would result, or you gather the result of two lots, each with 2,100 square feet. Does, does this affect parking? I mean, I'm look, I was confused when I saw these, like, how does it affect the parking and curb cuts, that some of the policies that we have? You know, I, I do apologize. The alley should not be in there. That does not affect the curb cut requirements because those are in the general plan. And the ordinance does not exempt these properties from complying with those general plan requirements as far as additional curb cuts or taking access from an alley. So when you have the new configuration, then you, you're set what is front yard setback changes, right? Yes, you would, because in these cases, on the peninsula, for example, you've got the districting maps that assign a frontage and a setback for that frontage. So typically, you have to do a zoning ordinance amendment to change the front setback okay. on your new frontage. So how does that work with surrounding properties? Is, is there, th there going to be a different setback pattern? Uh, well, in the cases we've looked at, what ends up happening is what now we're showing is the side street up there the lots to the left and to the right already have a reduced setback there at 9 or 10 feet, for example, as opposed to the default position you would have here would require 20 feet, which we would not recommend maintaining because the properties, you know, left, right, east, and west have only 9 or 10 feet setbacks on that side. So they would still require an ordinance amendment. Mr. Mayor? Yes. I, I'm quite. I'm not quite sure how you. I'm thinking about lots on the peninsula and how this actually would reply without <coughs> being an alley, but in this particular situation, I think there's a number of places in the community where alleys are there, and you're making it that much easier for somebody to do this. And in this particular instance, there you have your parking off the alley, and it's prohibited on the street here. In order to, particularly in the areas like the peninsula point and other areas, you want to preserve as much parking as possible here. You're creating a situation, and, and uh, Leslie mentioned the front setback, you have, all right, let's say you have a 10-foot setback here. When you rotate the lot, you end up having probably four, three feet in that area. So in other words, this guy can build his house in front of this person's view out the, towards, if this is really the water, uh, into, into the setback area. To me, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, to, and and I, I don't understand why we want to make this easier to happen. Plus, I, I'm, I really question the situation that you, you've drawn there without there being an alley. I think his point was that uh, the, the general plan policies would require that you provide uh, some additional parking to offset if you lose if you lose parking because of a curb cut, uh, additional on-site parking for guest parking, things of that nature. Yeah, but when you have a 35-foot lot, uh, if, if that's what the case is here, uh, you're, is a single-family zone or, or two-family? Uh, well, it depends. I mean, some okay, cases. Well, two-family, two you'd zone. have to have. Uh, you should have four parking spaces. That's correct. And it's almost impossible to get them in tandem and if you try to create the the extra parking spot uh, that that's needed for your curb cuts uh, it just doesn't make sense the, uh, well in this particular instance you would this would have to have an access someplace either on this street or on the side street the other thing is that that we tend to Instead of having a 10-foot rear yard setback like you would in most situations, you'll say, well, you only have a four, three foot here. Why don't we allow a three foot there? Are you going to uh, require all these to have a 10-foot rear yard setback? The code does require a 10-foot setback in this example. And how many modifications have you granted in examples like that where you make the setback the same as uh, the adjoining property? Uh, it's less likely now than it was a few <laughs> years back. <laughs> so what we're doing now is speculating about what somebody might want to do with that property. 
<coughs> and that's for a separate conversation, it seems to me. That, that, how, I think that how, needs to be contemplated here. How often does this come up, would you say? Not often, but if it's your property and you have to go through the map, then, you know, it's, it's a bigger deal. No, there aren't that many examples. How, how much of a bigger deal? I mean, is it $5,000 more bigger of a deal? Or? I, I'm sorry, sir? Dollar-wise, what would we be talking about? I, it, I would imagine it's about four or $5,000, yes, for a parcel map. Well, it could be, could be substantially more than that. Plus, I think one of the other things that, that happens, particularly in uh, areas like Belleville Island and out in the peninsula, is that if you have to go to a parcel map, you end up having to go to the Coastal Commission and uh, a lot of other problems you have to deal with with a lot line adjustment. You don't have to take that particular action to the Coastal Commission. Doesn't this create confusion, though? And, I mean, you're trying to get a somewhat uh, of a similarity in a neighborhood, and suddenly you've got half your houses going this way and some of your houses well, not, going not, this way. Not really. In fact, uh, you know, one of the suggestions that I'm going to be making as we go through and revise the zoning code is that we take the areas of the city that have these smaller lots, Belleville Island, Corona Del Mar, West Newport, and get rid of this 5,000 square foot minimum lot size. The prevailing subdivision pattern is what it is. It's 30 by 80 in some areas, 30 by 100 or whatever it is in other areas, but that's the prevailing lot subdivision pattern, but yet we have this minimum lot size that forces all kinds of uh, requirements on people when they get into these unusual situations that forces them into, um, you know, doing parcel maps and all other kinds of things, all kinds of exemptions and exceptions that uh, um, we're trying to force a larger lot size into an area that already has a predominant subdivision pattern. And, you know, many cities do that. Like, uh, I'll just use an example because I happen to be working there, Seal Beach in their downtown area. They have 25-foot wide lots, and um, they're 100 feet deep, and they have that set as the minimum lot size in that particular area of town. Well, why don't we just wait until that happens? Well, this is, this is I don't know when that's going to happen. This is a good interim solution that... Uh, that we can deal with right now. Uh, I'll give you a reason. I, from my perspective on the peninsula, uh, th this kind of a problem inhibits the redevelopment of properties and the revitalization of the peninsula. It's, an, it's just one more inhibitor that people, hoops, hoops that people have to go through, consider sometimes just decide, oh, the heck with it. And what I want to have is the ability for revitalization to occur without unnecessary obstacles in the way. Uh, I th do you feel that the residential really needs to be, is, is lagging in revitalization? I know your businesses are, but I mean, when you the residential seems like you've got a lot of very nice uh, remodels down there that... Uh, and we have a lot of substandard properties that mm -hmm. need to be redeveloped when you get up close to them. Okay, explain to me again why I'm assuming two separate property owners as opposed to one property owner is doing this. Uh, if the side street has water frontage, why the interior lot owner would, uh, 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 I mean, why the, the, the side street lot owner who has a much more valuable piece of property would want to uh, rotate that lot so that he can share that extra value with his next door neighbor. I don't understand. Typically, that. it's one landowner. It's not two landowners, Don. I've, I've never seen one with two landowners. Typically, it's one landowner that owns two lots. Oh, okay. In many instances, they uh, they have uh, you know one lot um, with part of the house on one lot and part of the house on the other lot, or a garage on one lot. I mean, there's all kinds of different configurations. Where would I, give me an example of where this might occur on the peninsula? I can't. I, well, I don't understand yeah, maybe that. yeah, maybe a better mechanism is an exception for a property that you have in mind versus a kind of a wholesale change that may be more appropriate through the committee and coming up to the council. And you know, when we look at Belva Island and all those other places, we're looking at the potential situation. But I think you have situations that could occur throughout the city that are on alleys. That if we make it that much easier, in Again, I haven't ever had to process a, a parcel map versus a lot line adjustment, but if I remember correctly, the mapping and surveying aspects of a, of a parcel map and the record of survey that has to accompany a, a lot line adjustment are virtually the same. It takes longer to go through the, the parcel map process, as I understand it. But uh, Just an informational item. Uh, 
you don't have to do under the Subdivision Map Act a record of survey for a simple lot line adjustment. Uh, I did check that. We've modified the subdivision code in the last. I know it's the state Subdivision years. Map Act. I know that's what I mean. We've modified that. That, uh, you know, I, I, it came to mind because I was just looking at it this afternoon, and that was the exception for a lot line adjustment. You just had to have it prepared by a license surveyor, but you didn't couldn't require. Okay, but that license survey. surveyor, when he puts new points in the ground, has to file a map with the county that shows where those points are, and that surveying process is virtually the same as a parcel map process. You're the engineer. I can only tell you what I read in the act. <laughs> Okay. So, Dave, before you sit down, so in that alley, in, let's say this was the case, and there is an alley there, and so now they need to get access off of the s streets as opposed to the alley for their parking. Would we permit that, or we wouldn't? Is, are there exceptions for that? <coughs> or not? Well, in, in current, we would not permit that, Mr. Mayor, because that was why you have a, uh, one item that's going to be coming back uh, next month because the applicant was looking to find a way if the resulting lots happened, they were looking for a way to provide access to the lot that still adjoins the front street from the alley. So they would essentially be coming across the So it would be like property. an easement across the back of the yes, sir. interior lot. That let's was what it. they were looking at. Okay. Yeah. Can we limit this to, to non alley frontage lots? <laughs> uh, it, it's your ordinance. I, yeah, there's there's I, I, protections I, I, for the alley situation. We already have those. Uh, you haven't sold me, so I let's move this on. I'll make a motion to deny this action. Second. Okay. Anyone from the public want to comment? Okay. Seeing none, I'll bring it back. Any further discussion? I'm going to I'm going to propose the motion. I think this is a, a good thing for us to move forward on and to solve a lot of problems that uh, we seem to have dealing with lot line adjustments and parcel maps and in all of our beach areas, whether it's the peninsula or Corona Del Mar or yeah. Malibu Island. So yeah, it's not just the, it's just it's not just the peninsula and the beach areas. There are lots of areas around the city where I think this would be helpful to facilitate revitalization. So I will we'll oppose the motion as well. Okay. Please vote. With council members Hen, Rosansky, Curry, and Selich voting no, <clears throat> the motion fails. Okay. I'll entertain a motion for approval. Move approval. Second. Okay. Please vote. With council members Webb, Gardner, and Daigle voting no, the motion carries. Okay, uh, Madam Clerk. Motion for reconsideration. <clears throat> a motion to reconsider the vote on any action taken by the city council at either this meeting or the previous meeting may be made only by one of the council members who voted with the prevailing side. Okay, any motions for reconsideration? We don't need to do anything relative to the Restaurant Association bid. Just to put a placeholder down in case we need this, the fix for that comes back and requires that. I'm sorry, Councilman. Do we need to take any action to, re, to put the reconsideration of the restaurant bid out just in case that's part of the solution that we talked about coming back to us with relative to the increased assessment? And, uh, no. Okay. It, it's, it's my understanding that we're going to take a look and see what the mechanism is with respect to it. I can't. Other than that, I, I'm not sure right. I can. I have dollars. <laughs> okay, we're adjourned.